Season 2 of Star Trek The Next Generation took many steps to fix the problems of the painful first season, most notably in decreasing Gene Roddenberry's influence on the show. But it isn't until Season 3 that the show really breaks out. Gone are the pajama onesies of the first season, the silly and overacted melodrama finds a more grounded philosophical tone, driven more by character and less by the alien menagerie. Perhaps most importantly, Riker gets a beard. <laughs> Tin Man is the 20th episode of the show's breakout season. In it, the crew are dispatched to investigate a starship that is a living entity. The creature, deemed Tin Man, has moved into a system with a star about to go supernova as, the crew theorizes, it has decided to kill itself. He is supremely lonely, out amongst the stars with no one to connect to. In order to facilitate communication with the creature, the crew brings a special envoy, an individual with psychic power turned on so loud he can hear the thoughts of every member of the crew on board simultaneously and whose power is so personally invasive it has rendered him bitterly antisocial and a loner. That character's name was Tam Elbrin. <laughs> <laughs> I love that name, by the way. Played by Harry Groner. As a passionate fan of both Buffy and Star Trek, I've always loved the parallels between those episodes. And, like Tin Man in Star Trek Season 3, Earshot is one of my favorite one-offs in Buffy Season 3, a season almost overburdened by terrific ones. Buffy is battling two mouthless demons in the park, and after killing one of them, happens to absorb some of their blood through her hand. While the gang is trying to put the information Buffy and Angel conned out of faith to use, Buffy is noticing the demon blood spot is getting slightly itchy. Or maybe she's got a case of the creepy crawlies from Angel and Faith's kiss, even though those are a pair of lips he took for the team. Buffy realizes the itchy hand has to do with mouthless demon blood, and Giles informs her she's likely going to manifest some aspect of the demon itself. Hope it's not the outside part. Willow complains about the darkness lately in the school paper. Likely she's the only one in the group who actually reads it, and Buffy tells her about the aspect of the demon. Was it a boy demon? Out on patrol that evening, Buffy and Angel run into each other and things are most certainly strained. Buffy explains the incoming aspect of the demon and Angel is typically reassuring. No matter what, I'll always be with you. The next day at school, while talking about the game Buffy missed the night before, Xander spies Cordelia talking to Wesley. Buffy overhears his thoughts and realizes the aspect of the demon is upon her. As she walks the hall, she's given a special tour of all the unfiltered thoughts of the teenagers around her. It's a cute and adorable scene, but every time I watch it, I'm struck by how being a teenage girl privy to all the unfiltered thoughts of all the teenage boys around you would actually be kind of a terrifying nightmare. In class, the students are going over Othello and Iago's use of jealousy to turn Othello against Desdemona. Despite the fact that the classroom lesson's direct ties to the episode themes can be a bit on the nose, this use of Othello is really one that I love. And it's a play that's been referenced before, when Spike told Drew he would chop Buffy into messes. Here, the play Othello maps pretty well over the events of this season. In this case, Iago is Faith, and Buffy is Othello. Due to the recent events of the season, Buffy is now suffering a wave of jealousy over having seen Angel and Faith kiss, and Buffy's proposed thesis of the play here may as well be directly describing her relationship with Faith. Is there something else at work here? Well, he, um, he sort of admits himself that his motives are spurious. He does things because he uh, enjoys them. It's like he's not, he's not really a person. He's a, the dark half of Othello himself. And in this episode, Buffy's aspect of the demon is actually a metaphor for her jealousy over Faith and Angel. And there's this thing in me and I can't find it. I, I can't stop it. Buffy heads to the mansion to try and use the aspect of the D to fish out any amorous faith thoughts from Angel. She fails since Angel as a vampire doesn't give off a psychic reflection. And in Angel's open-hearted reply, Buffy seems to come to grips with her own jealousy. Giles and Buffy decide to share with the group her recent aspect of the demon, and we get a stellar scene in which Buffy traverses the thoughts of each of the Scoobies. What's so wonderful is the way in which each of their thoughts informs their characters in such a pitch-perfect manner. I am my thoughts. If they exist in her, Buffy contains everything that is me, and she becomes me. I cease to exist. As she walks the halls again, this time she discovers a host of anxieties the students are carrying around with them. And Giles finds out that a man who had this problem recently went insane from it because he couldn't turn it off. As they discover this, Buffy is overwhelmed in the lunchroom by the ceaseless noise, but manages to pluck a single thought from the ether. This time tomorrow, I'll kill you all. <laughs> 
The Scoobies begin a profile of the students to try and find the disgruntled one whose thought Buffy managed to hone in on. They believe the editor of the school paper to be at fault. Wesley and Giles recruit Angel to kill the second demon and get its heart so they can brew the potion to save Buffy. Meanwhile, at the school, Jonathan has brought a rifle to the clock tower and everyone is worried he's the murderer. Buffy climbs the tower and confronts Jonathan, who she discovers is instead suffering from the crushing weight of social expectations. I came up here to kill myself. In the cafeteria, Xander stumbles on the actual killer, the school lunch lady, and in a fight with Buffy, we get the most hilarious case of, oh look, the stunt double, as the lunch lady magically drops in size by half and maybe grows a penis. And the episode ends with Buffy perfectly and gloriously revealing to Giles that she knows. Part of the process of adolescence is moving from a purely egocentric point of view, do I belong, am I accepted, to one that is more empathetic and compassionate. As I mentioned in the top 10 Buffy or Angel episodes that remind us everything is going to be all right. It's the realization that everyone around you is living a life rich with as much detail, desire, and drama as your own, and that we are all no more or less important than anyone else. And throughout much of season three, Buffy has been facing down her selfish demons and dealing with them, as she did in the episodes Homecoming and Consequences. And while she's always shown compassion for her friends in the Scooby Circle, in her shot, she gets a massive dose of the human condition through the psychic powers she can't turn off, and shares as much with Jonathan. It's an awareness she carries for the rest of her life. Among the Scooby Circle, perhaps the least selfish and most patient is Buffy herself. I have so much deep love for this episode. There's a certain level of wish fulfillment in the general concept. We're all trapped in our own heads, which can be a profoundly lonely feeling. Our lifelong quest for intimacy and connection with other people is driven by a deep hunger to reach across that barrier, to genuinely know and be known by someone else. Buffy's power here to do that has a genie in the bottle kind of appeal to it. As ever, one of the best scenes in the episode happens to be when it's just our circle of characters sitting in a library talking. Buffy is all of us, we think. Therefore, she is. And I love that so much. Buffy's compulsion to try and use this newfound superpower to delve into her boyfriend's mind and quell her own insecurities is simultaneously believable and adorable. Oh, this honesty stuff is fun. And of course, there's the final scene in which I consider a Giles almost gets knocked out counter. I have only two incredibly minor quibbles with Earshot. The first is that at the start of the episode, the Scoobs are attempting to make sense of the information they learned from Faith and getting nowhere. While Buffy now can literally read minds, couldn't they have somehow arranged a chance meeting? meeting with the mayor or Faith to try and steal more information from their thoughts, perhaps the onset of the paralyzing psychic power came too quickly. My second gripe with the episode is how quickly Buffy's slightly depressing speech is able to sway Jonathan to give up his plan. As someone who has personally dealt with some deep, dark depression at various times in my life, including high school, I'll say that Buffy's assertion that nobody cares because they're all too busy caring about themselves probably wouldn't have been what I needed to hear at my darkest times. Not that it's untrue, but when you're feeling so depressed as to be on the verge of drastic measures, her statement always struck me as something that would have made Jonathan feel worse about himself, not better. And it's a terribly short scene. Buffy has gained this perspective through a whole day with a magical ability. Jonathan is expected to understand it in a short dialogue with a girl he doesn't really know. As a contrasting example, consider Buffy's conversation with Angel at the end of Amends. Sure, Jonathan isn't really a fully formed character at this point, but the conversation still could have felt more convincing if Buffy instead shared, say, the reasons she dropped out of her own life at one point and how she found the courage to come back to it. As it went, though, the scene in the clock tower just didn't quite do it for me. That's me projecting some, of course, and I accept that. Buffy is still the main character in the episode, and it's her journey that is of primary importance to the story, which is why I find that scene totally forgivable, and consider Earshot to be in the running for best season three one-off. Earshot was originally scheduled to air April 27th, 1999, but seven days beforehand, the Columbine massacre occurred, and the WB decided not to air it until nearly the start of season four some five months later. According to Wikipedia, Sarah Michelle Gellar lobbied hard to have this air on time, thinking the material could actually help those affected. I'm of two minds about it, but I'll preface by saying the only thing I can state conclusively is I don't have anything wise to say on the topic of violence in media or schools. I can only speak from my own personal experience. When the Columbine shooting occurred, I lived 25 minutes away and had just graduated high school the year before. I had cousins who went to school there. As much as the message in earshot is diametrically opposed to what happened happened at Columbine seven days from the event, the last thing I think any of us wanted at the time was to turn on our television and see a gun in the hand of a high school student. But that said, just as I believe no topic should be off limits from humor, I don't think the topic of guns in school should be taken off fiction's table simply because it's one we're terrified of in real life. But 
If you don't have a perspective or something of value to say about it, it can be an extremely bad taste. It's too bad then that school shooting has become something of a genre in contemporary television. But Earshot has a perspective, and a valuable one at that. Buffy's development of empathy here is the next logical step in her growth this season, and will have some beautiful ramifications in the prom and graduation day. It's an incredibly important process, especially for Buffy, as being the Slayer can be so isolating for her. Significantly, it's the characteristic that distinguishes her the most from Faith.